You ready to hear the word of God tonight? Well, we're going back to where we were on verse number 23. Uh, in the book of Acts chapter, I think we're in chapter 4, is that right? I'm just looking at the verses, so I'm not sure, but I think it's chapter 4. <laughs> Acts chapter 4. Verse number 23 starts out, and being let go, is that right? Amen. All right, thank you so much, Rose, helping me out. <laughs> so we, we, last Wednesday night we talked about how that John and Peter were arrested you know why they were arrested anybody remember why they were arrested this is a test why did they arrest John and Peter no why <laughs> okay the reason they the, the core reason that they got arrested was because of the healing of the crippled man going into the temple, stirred up so much trouble, the miracle. So, you know, just, just to go back over that a moment to tell you that we cry out to God for miracles, but sometimes you need to say, God, not, not only do I need a miracle, but prepare me for the, for the other side of that. <laughs> because we never know uh, sometimes when these good things come that we've been wanting to come, Sometimes it doesn't mean that everybody's going to just thank you, just, you know. <laughs> that, that was the most wonderful thing that ever happened. So opposition is what the book of Acts is about, but it's also about another theme that I wanted to share with you tonight to start off with. And so we're going to read this to, uh, we've already talked about it. You know, uh, I can't talk about it enough because I think it's so crucially important. So we're in, we're going we're gonna to read a few verses. It says, And being let go, they went, in, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard it, this is the, this is the crowd of believers. And when they heard, heard that, which was what the, um, the chief priests and all of them had said, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who's, who's by the mouth of your servant David has said, why did the heathen rage? Now, this is the second psalm that they're using to praise God. And they're recognizing that this psalm was, for, was forward-thinking prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah. So they're actually going to quote a lot of the second psalm here. But before we get into that, I want to make this strong point, and I hope that this is getting uh, just written in our spirit as we study the Word of God, about the necessity of being a part of a body of believers. Uh, the, the, John and Peter have just been arrested for the gospel's sake. They've been arrested because they were used of God. Had they not been available to use, be used of God, had they not been going about the service of the Lord, just sitting somewhere over in a corner, they would have never been in any kind of trouble. So quite often we step back away from things so we don't have to deal with trouble. That's a strong statement. You know, sometimes we just rather be quiet rather than to stir up anybody. I'm one of those. Is anybody else in the room one of those? Man, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'd just rather go along and get along. <laughs> I'd just rather everybody be happy, you know. Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> I, I, I'd rather that. I'm not a candidate, nor am I a promoter of any kind of trouble. I, I like for things that, you know, just, just sail along there. But you know what? People who ever did anything for God always cause trouble. Always, they're always trouble, stirring up trouble. I should get Brother John to preach this lesson tonight because he's good at stirring up trouble, I think. <laughs> I think he stirred up trouble everywhere he went. <laughs> But the, so did, uh, you know, he's in good company because so did the Apostle Paul. But the only problem is when you are in resistance, 
to things that are ungodly and coming against it and standing for righteousness, not only do you cause trouble, but you cause trouble for yourself. You can't say, well, God's so good, he just protects me from everything and I'm gonna just go through this life without anything coming against me. Well, that's contrary to what has ever happened before. And I did tell you a few Wednesday nights ago that you are serving the most hated God, most hated man that ever walked on this earth is who your God is. He is the most hated, still is, always will be until he comes back to set up his kingdom. He will always be hated by those who are in power because they, they don't like it that you won't compromise and bow down to them. Because people who have great power and wealth don't like it that you don't need them. And so consequently, you stir up trouble when you stand up and say, I don't need you. Because there are people in this world who want you to be dependent upon them. And that gives them more what? Power. The more dependent you are, the more power they've got. So when we, when we start stirring up things or going contrary to the natural flow of things, the next thing you know, you're going to meet opposition. Just to give you the illustration my dad has used many times, and I've told you this illustration before, but it's someone that he knew that worked at a certain plant and uh, left, and there was another guy in the church that was working there and he said, man, how do you work at that place? Man, they hate Christians at that place. I tried to work there, but it was, the opposition was so strong against me for being a Christian, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to leave. And the man said to him, he said, well, I, I, that's no problem for me. I don't have any problem working there. I just don't tell anybody I am a Christian. You get the point? Why? Because he didn't want any opposition. So, when you're out there and you're knocked around, beat around, talked about, everybody's saying things about you, doing things because of your, your faith in Christ, you need a place where people love you. Thank God for the love of God. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know about you, but I know he loves me, but I don't see him every day. There are some people that evidently see him every day. They talk to him all the time, see him every day. But I'm not in that crowd yet. Maybe one of these days. I, I have no doubt that he's there, but, I, you know, when I'm driving down the road in my car, I, I don't look over there and see Jesus. Now, some of y'all might, but I, I don't. So consequently, it's so good to come together with people who are in the same boat, it's so good to know that you're not alone. It's good to know that somebody cares enough about you to reach out to you, to encourage you. It's so important, and that's what Peter and John knew in this passage. They didn't, after they got out of jail, they didn't walk around town to continue preaching revival services. They didn't go down to the temple immediately and start doing some kind of revival. We had the healing. Come on over here. This is a healing tent revival, you know. No, they didn't do that. Some of us would have had a man jump up and been on cripple 40 years. We might have set up a, set up a great big camp meeting thing. We, whoo, come on over here. <laughs> now, we're the men, we're the guys that, that you saw raise that man up from, from his cripple position. Get over here. We'll lay hands on you. Come on. But that's not, what, that's not what Peter and John did. You know why? Because they weren't concerned about the things that concerned people. They were concerned about the kingdom of God. And they knew that more than being acclaimed by somebody shouting their name and thinking how wonderful they were, they needed to be sustained. They needed to be undergirded. We need each other. We are not an island unto ourselves. We're not. You know, uh, I, I just mentioning Brother John, John Peters doesn't need to go to church. He, he can go preach somewhere. He can go somewhere. There are people who want him to come here and go there all the time. 
He doesn't need to come sit here at church. I haven't really talked to him about this, but I believe with all my heart that he understands the need to be in a body of believers who he can run to. I just believe that. And I believe, is that right, Brother John? That's why he's here. And I appreciate it. And I'm kind of like, if, if Paul needed it, if Peter needed it, if John needed it, and of course, you know, the amazing thing about Jesus, Jesus was the most perfect man who ever lived. But every time he went to a town, where'd he go? Where'd he go? He went to the synagogue. Was the synagogue perfect? Were all the people who went to the synagogue Christians? No, they didn't even really agree with him at all. They didn't know who he was. He was the only one who had a right to criticize all those synagogues. But you know, he didn't criticize them. You know what he did? He went. He went to the place of meeting. People sitting home are so much better than Jesus. I'm not talking about people that are sitting home sick or for other reasons. I'm talking about people that are sitting home because they think every church is imper so imperfect I can't go there. They're putting themselves up above Jesus. Because Jesus understood, even as God in the flesh, that he needed bodies of people to encourage and strengthen him and go with him through this walk. So it's important for all of us to know, and I, you're here, and you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir. But I want to reassure you and reestablish you and give you also something to say to those crazy people out there who think that they can just go out there on their own and they think they're so great they don't need anybody. I'm not talking down to people. I'm just saying we need to talk to them intelligently and make them understand why they are wrong. We must help them if we can. So John and Peter, some of the choice apostles of Jesus, immediately after being released from prison, went straight to the place of meeting for the many believers that had come into unity in the body of Christ. Now, all of them weren't perfect. All of these believers weren't perfect. You're going to see that in a few minutes. God help us to not hold people to a standard. You've got to be so high up on the spiritual rung before you can be my, my comforter or my friend. You know, the Bible says out of mouth of babes. Sometimes there's little children that will tell you something if you just listen. Because, it, it, you know, it doesn't matter. People that we consider to be less intelligent than us, sometimes we're just too smart for our own britches. Y'all probably don't know what britches are, do you? Some of you young people don't. <laughs> you don't know? Are you old or young? Oh, okay. <laughs> I know Tara said, Nana, what are britches? <laughs> But we, we get too smart sometimes, and we, sometimes we need somebody that we consider not be so smart to bring us into, you know, change our gears and, and bring us to the place where we can, we can realize that we need somebody else sometimes. We get so busy. We get so busy being critical of people. God forgive us and break that bondage in any one of us. You know, it's... it's it's just easy to find fault with people. That's the devil's business. You can be realistic and know that people have problems, but you don't have to be critical and mean about it, you know? And I don't think you are, but, you know, I'm giving you a vaccination <laughs> from those things that might come up because I'm telling you, it'll damage your soul. It'll damage your soul when you start bringing people down and, and lifting yourself up, the next thing you know, you don't feel like you need anybody. And I'm going to tell you, I need you. I need you. I just want you to know that. Every single one of you in this room. And then it says, they're, they're quoting, like I said, they're quoting the second psalm. If you've never read the second psalm, it's all about the Messiah. In fact, most of, just all the book of Psalms has something to do with the Messiah. 
But this one is directly about the Messiah. It starts off with the first part of what he said when he hung on the cross and ends with the last part of what he said when he hung on the cross. And it also says this, why do the heathens rage and the people imagine vain things? Does it sound like 2021? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against your holy child, Jesus, whom you have anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. This was for the purpose of dealing with this Christ. For to do whatsoever your hand and your counsel determined before to be done. Now, what these leaders didn't know is that God set out this plan and the plan they were going to work out was going to be the plan of God, but they didn't do it as the plan of God. They did it in opposition to God. I want you to know that God can work in mysterious ways and cause things to come to pass. He doesn't have to use everybody that's a saint. He doesn't have to use everybody that's perfect because he sure would be in trouble getting anything done. He uses faulty people, people that are faulty, people that have sinned, people that have problems. He uses those kinds of people. Sometimes he even uses a reprobate to do God's work. So we should never limit what God wants to do by deciding in advance that it ain't going to be that way. Keep a door open in your heart and mind for whatever God wants to do. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And grant to you, they didn't say behold their threatenings and find, give us a place to hide. Listen. They didn't say protect us from all their threatenings. Did they? That's what I'd pray, Lord. <laughs> Oh, God, <laughs> help me to have, be able to stay home and hide in the corner. Come on. They didn't say that. They said, Lord, behold their threatenings. Not wrong to, it's not, not wrong to admit that there's trouble out there. And grant unto your servants that with boldness they may speak your word. You know what they were saying? Give me the boldness that I will not be pressured even if it means i got to go to jail. That's what they're saying. Give us boldness. Even if we're going to end up in jail just like they just saw it happen. John and Peter got arrested and they're all saying, all this congregation, and could have been thousands there because there had been thousands that had come to know Christ. And they were saying these words. Give us the boldness in, in the face of the fact that we might, you know, if you think you might get arrested, it'd take a lot of boldness to go out there and start doing the same thing over again, wouldn't it? And thank God for the supernatural grace of God that does exactly what they were asking him to do. Because I'm going to tell you, in our flesh, we run from trouble. But the Holy Spirit runs face into it. Then it says, by stretching forth your hand to heal, they just got in trouble for a healing, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child, Jesus. That's the one they told him not to speak in that name. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. Oh, God, help us to pray more. God help us when before we ever come here to be a congregation of people that are prayed up. That we don't wait to come to church for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. But that we seek the face of God so that when we come together, the power of God will already be in operation in all of our hearts and lives. That we come together already focused, already ready to believe that God is the mighty, powerful God that He is already in his presence, already worshiping when we come in the door. That's what we need to do. Don't come to church and sit here and go, oh, I sure hope you can sing something that'll jive me up. Come on, we just dare the congregation, we just dare the singers. Y'all sing something to make me happy. Come on. It's not the way it's supposed to be. You should be making the singers happy. 
Come on, people back here. You know that makes those singers just sing their hearts out. When they see you back there shouting and praising God and worshiping and singing and glory, hallelujah. And I'm telling you, the people up here, finally we'd get saved if y'all do that. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> At least they'd get a whole lot more excited. Come on. I tell you, get up there and start shouting and running around. And Sister, Sister Connie will come right down off that stage and join you. I guarantee you that. <laughs> So, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, this doesn't mean that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. This meant that the Holy Spirit came in a mighty way, like a wind, upon them, and they were empowered and emboldened, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given to you to make you bold for service. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is given to you to embolden you for service. That's why we need to be praying in the Holy Ghost. If you've ever been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have a prayer language. God has given you a prayer language, some way to pray. You need to be using that prayer language on a regular basis. Praying in, the, in, in tongues, when you're driving down the road, if you can't, find a place to be alone. You know, I have found out after being baptized with the Holy Spirit that once I start worshiping God, it's not long before I'm speaking in tongues. Just to yield to that and begin to speak in tongues more. Because uh, this is not for the deliverance from sin. This is not for uh, victory over sin. This, this empowering, praying in the Holy Ghost, edifies you, builds you up, and makes you bold. I, I, I preached Sunday morning about confidence. Confidence and boldness are the same thing. If I could, if I have confidence that I'm welcome, I walk in boldly, you know? Come on. If you have confidence, if I know, like, if I knew the president or if I knew the governor personally, and I knew beyond a shadow doubt they really liked me, Come on. I knew I was really a good, good friend of the governor. Man, I'd walk right down to Baton Rouge and go in there, and I'd say, I came in here to see the governor. Who are you? Well, I'm so-and-so. You ought to know my name because the governor knows who I am, and he likes me. Come on. And I'd go right into the governor's office with my head up. But otherwise, since he don't know me from Job's, tur Job's turkey, I would walk down there and I'd walk in the, well, you know, I don't know if the governor really wants to see me, but I really would like to have an appointment to talk to him. Come on, because you know what? I have no confidence that I could get in there. Come on, I might I'd come better there, I guess, than in the president's office, I realize that. But, but I don't have access because, and I would not be bold. Come on. Why, because? of that empowering, emboldening of the Holy Spirit that causes you to rise up and do things that will amaze you. A boldness that will rise up in you and give you the ability to speak and wisdom, give you understanding of the things of God, and all of a sudden you'll be doing and saying things that when you walk away, you'll be going, how'd that happen? I mean, I have never preached a sermon well, take that back. I preached one or two that I don't know if God showed up or not. But uh, I, I've never preached a sermon when I walked out of the pulpit that I felt like I had said what God wanted to say, that I wasn't overwhelmed. Like, Lord, how, how in the world? I don't know how you use me. But I thank you. Because it's amazing to me when God uses me to put together a message and to deliver it. It amazes me. So each one of us, must understand that we need the emboldening power of the Holy Spirit. You need it. Not, it's not a smart aleck thing. God's not a smart aleck. He's just not a pushover. And he's not afraid to speak the truth. If you don't believe it, read the Bible. Even when it's not popular. So each one of us need to depend upon that mighty Holy Spirit to embolden us. I don't know about you, but I want to take a stand for righteousness and never be afraid to just speak the truth in a situation. How about you? Come on. God help us. 
In the first place, he's helped us to know the truth. And then he'll help us to be bold to speak it. So they spoke the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that, that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Now I'm going to go back to the reason for this. Some people say this is communism. It's not. The reason that the early church had all things common was because the majority of the early church had already lost everything for accepting Christ. There were many people in the early church who lost their homes, lost their vocations, they lost their dwelling places, they lost their heritage, they lost property, they lost. You know, Paul said, I count it all as dung. You know why? Paul lost it. Paul lost his heritage. It's possible Paul even lost a wife and a family. We don't know. He wasn't married. I mean, no, he was single, evidently, when he wrote. But evidently, he may have lost because it was un unusual that Paul wouldn't have been married. So he may have lost a wife, lost children. He may have lost. Who knows what he lost? But he said, I count it all as dung. I count it all as nothing. So it's important for this group of people, if they didn't put everything in the pot, somebody was going to starve to death. If they didn't put everything together, put all their wealth together, their community wasn't going to make it. So consequently, because of that, they began to sell property, they began to uh, gather together possessions so that everybody would have their needs met and families could be sustained to the situation that they were in. It was an unusual situation. It's not something that you would do just every day because you might not need to do that. Just because somebody's got a need doesn't mean you're supposed to go supply it. Just because somebody needs something doesn't mean you're supposed to sell your house. You know, there are preachers over the years that tell people, sell your home and give me a donation of it. I'm sorry, that, that doesn't mean you're supposed to. Just because somebody is doing without doesn't mean you're their answer. They may be doing without for reasons you don't understand. So you need to be led by the Spirit. But when it comes into persecution, like it was back then, and the onslaught against believers, and people truly were stripped of everything, they brought together their goods so that they could supply one another and so that everybody would be okay. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord and great grace was upon them all. This is the beginning, the inception of the grace dispensation of time where we have walked in for all these years, that powerful message of the grace of God. Neither was there any among them who lacked. Do you see that? Even though they had lost everything, there was none among them who lacked. Why? Because everybody just brought it all together. So nobody was doing without. You know, I've always thought that if I was in a crowd of people and I'm, I'm the only one who's eating, that would be horrible, wouldn't it? I'd say, it's may, this may be just my meal, but let's see how much we can break it up and everybody get a bite. And so nobody in this crowd lacked because they put it all at the feet of Jesus. They gave it all. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and bought the prices of these things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who was by the apostles, was, named, was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyrus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Who is this? Barnabas. He did a gracious deed. He, he joined in to do what is needed. But let me explain something to you because we're going to go to chapter 5 just for a few minutes. There are people who cannot stand not to be recognized. Now, I, I thank God you're not some of those people. Y'all are wonderful. This church, is, and generally as a whole, you're willing to go above and beyond, and you don't need praise for it. 
I can say that from the bottom of my heart. You are an exceptional church. There is nobody that I know of that wants any kind of position to be hierarchy and a big shot. You are all just one. You work together. You promote each other. You love each other. I've never been in a church like this until this one. It amazes me. You're wonderful. You are. You give. You love. You encourage. I thank you. I really do. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing you, you should appreciate. You should appreciate it. Because it's not everywhere. <laughs> thank you, Courtney, you sweetheart. I'm going to tell you what, it, the reason when you leave and go somewhere sometimes it's so good to get back home is because of that spirit in many places of self-exaltation. It amazes me. I mean, we've had people come with great talent and sit on the back seat and do absolutely nothing for years, but just keep a right spirit and keep on serving Jesus. It's amazing. It's amazing. Just overwhelming. It really is. And it's not to y'all because you don't have a clue. <laughs> but I know what it's like because I've been a preacher's kid all my life. There are always people that want a lot of recognition. And if you don't give it to them, they're going to stir up trouble, but it ain't going to be the right kind of trouble. There are people, if they can't get promoted, they'll go try to gather them a little following. Go door to door, house to house, try to turn people against people, try to bring strife into the church. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. They want to be exalted. There are people that think they own the piano bench or think they own the whatever and don't ever let anybody take my place or I will do whatever. That kind of hatefulness in the, king, in the supposed to be kingdom of God, that they're not in the kingdom of God, they're just going to church. We have two here, Ananias and Sapphira. Now, if, ever, if this ever happened in any, many churches, it would, cease, it would cease anybody trying to show out. Trust me. You know, in the Old Testament, it's, if, if a child sassed his parents, they got stoned to death. I bet they didn't have very many kids that had a sassy mouth in the Old Testament. <laughs> Wouldn't take but one stoning for me to learn. I don't know about you. <laughs> Wouldn't take but one, one kid getting stoned. I'd be shutting up from then on. <laughs> but if this happened now in the church, there wouldn't be very many people wanting to take the front row. Ananias and Sapphira. It says, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphire's wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now listen to this part, see. It didn't, wasn't that he had to give it all. He didn't have to. And that's what Peter's going to say. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own power? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have, you have, you have not lied unto man, but unto God. He's, do you understand? Peter's saying to him, it didn't matter that you wanted to keep part of the money. It, that wasn't the sin. That wasn't the issue. The issue was trying to look like somebody you're not and, and gathering or planning a lie to show off. You know, this is the original sin, the sin of pride. The sin of pride is the original sin. People say all the time, Lord, I, you know, and it's a hard prayer to it's hard prayer to pray to say God humble me. I just say Lord help me to be humble. Help me to humble myself. 
I don't know, that, that Lord humbling me thing might be a little tough. But the Bible says in verse 5, for, and Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. That means he died on the spot. And great fear came on all them who heard these things, except one person didn't hear it. And the young man, yeah, she was over there somewhere patting herself on the back. She couldn't hear nothing. And the young man arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours. I don't know why she didn't hear the news in three hours. She must have been somewhere looking in the mirror or something. <laughs> when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes. Liar, liar, pants on fire. For so much. So they worked this lie out. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of God? Behold, the feet of them which carried your husband are at the door and shall carry you out. Then she fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead. And carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. You say, well, why, Sister Allen, would it happen at this particular time in history that this story uh, developed? And I was meditating on that. I think at the introduction of the great grace of God, sometimes people start believing that God's just a pushover, that God doesn't really mean all the things he said because all this grace means, you know, it's a license for me to be disobedient. It's a license for me. It's so much grace. Where grace, you know, where sin abounds, grace abounds. You know, those verses. And we can get, you know, people, I never have because I went a long road to get to where I got. <laughs> but many people began to feel like God just didn't, he didn't really mean what he said. God understands. God understands the way I am. My situation, God understands. They begin to make excuses and bring God down to something he's not. Just because they oversimplify grace. I want you to understand the grace of God is endless. But the grace of God never sanctions sin and if you want to blame all this stuff on the grace of God you have no understanding of the grace of God to whom much is given much is required I've been given a lot of grace I don't know about you I remember in the middle of my bitter anger and frustration and agony that I went through, I prayed every day for the Lord to let a truck run over me. I did. I know y'all think that's crazy, but I really did want to die. I didn't want to kill myself because I thought I'd go to hell if I did that, and I didn't hate myself that much. Didn't want to go to hell. But I believe the lie of the devil that told, him, told me that everybody would be better off without me. That's what the lie, the lie is that people believe when they commit suicide. I just believe that. I thought if I could just die, that would get this all, I'd be fine, everybody would be fine, everybody would be happy. The grace of God didn't answer my stupid prayer. <laughs> I'm so thankful he didn't. I'm so thankful he didn't answer that stupid prayer. His great grace. Instead, showed up and showed me the right way. Instead, thank God. I'm so amazed. I was telling somebody, I think Carol and I were eating lunch the other day, and we were talking about this, and I said, Many years ago, I got to no, I got to stop. But that many years ago, a great friend of mine that loves me and I loved her, she passed away. But she gave me a necklace, 
It's a valuable necklace, probably the most valuable piece of jewelry I own. I treasure, treasure it. I don't throw it down on the floor. I don't just stick it somewhere in my car underneath a corner somewhere. I don't do that. I wear it gently, I love it, and I hang it gently where I want it to be cared for. It means something to me, it's precious to me. This grace I found, I fight a circle saw, as I used to say, to be sure people know not to mess with it. Don't mess with it. Don't cheapen it. Don't pollute it. Don't mess it up in the hearts of people that need to know it. Because it's precious to me beyond every piece of gold on this planet beyond every dollar bill and every provision and every wealth and every possession, this wonderful grace that I walk in is so valuable to me. I can't stand to see it messed up. I can't stand to see it polluted. It makes me angry. I, I can't help it, it just does. When I hear a preacher preach a sermon on TV, which I don't hear very often, and they tell everybody how to, you've got to live right, you've got to not do this, you've got to do this, and then at the end they don't tell them how, then I'm just like, <sighs> you got all that money to be on TV and you're not telling anybody. The grace and the powerful grace of God and the provision, it just <sighs> gets under my skin because I treasure, treasure, more than I can ever put into words, this wonderful truth. That's why God wanted this, allowed this to happen. He wanted people to know that even though they were opening up this wonderful knowledge of the grace through Jesus Christ and Him crucified, they were still messing with the Holy God. You're not gonna take away the holiness and the purity of God and what he expects. You're not gonna take it away. It had to be established at the beginning of the revelation of grace. It must never be lost to us. God didn't give you all this grace to make you a sinner. He gave you all this grace to set you free from the power of sin. And I'm gonna tell you right now, church, it's something to hold on to for dear life. It's the only thing that will take you through to the other side. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I went over a little bit. God bless you. I love you.